clue about Rock of Ages. Uh, tip lady, was it? Tap lady, something? Oh, tip, yeah, exactly. Um, but I want to remind you of a, a, a verse in Rock of Ages, Cleft for me. Part of a verse, it says, Let me hide myself in thee. And here it is. Be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. It's a double-edged gospel, isn't it? And that's actually um, what we're looking at this morning. We're looking at particularly not so much forgiveness, and inevitably we think about that and we worship God about that already, but we're thinking about deliverance from the power of sin. Forgiveness is of things we've committed in the past, maybe yesterday, maybe a couple of minutes ago when we had a naughty thought about somebody, who knows. Uh, deliverance is about the present time and the future. Deliverance from the power of sin. I, I think we're looking at verse 5 onwards, 5 to 11, and uh, if I had to put a heading over it, I think I'd choose out of a number possibly, real freedom. Real freedom. Jesus said, didn't he, um, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. And he was talking to his hearers who he'd described as uh, in bondage to sin. But if I set you free, you will be free indeed. Hallelujah. I think the most memorable time in prison for me was the time spent in Dartmoor. Uh, not, not as an inmate, <laughs> though I probably deserved to be. And, uh, and Dartmoor is empty at the moment. I forget why it is. Please, I'm sorry. Great old gas. What? It's radon gas. Oh, yeah, radon, yeah. It's an excuse for lots of things, isn't it? Anyway. <laughs> it's, uh, it does exist. <laughs> yeah, I was there as a preacher of the gospel, invited to come and preach to however many of the prisoners were either allowed or wanted to come into this building and hear something from God. And I, I remember that time very vividly for a number of reasons. The first remembrance of it was to hear prisoners marching along echoing corridors from their cells, marching and singing onward Christian soldiers. And some of them, I'm sure, were with it in spirit. And some of them were just joining in because it's a well-known <coughs> hymn and uh, they enjoyed marching to it as they came in because they knew they were going to get a free cup of tea, even if nothing else. And I remember that, but I also sadly remember that when they all came in and they sat down in their seats, the warders slid off to the right-hand side into a corner and buried themselves in their newspapers. Sad, but that's how things are, isn't it? Uh, but the other vivid thing I can think about is that when I left the prison, they escorted me. I did, they didn't say, see yourself out, because <laughs> you can't open those big gates unless you've got the, uh, the right tools for it. And somebody escorted me to those big gates of Dartmoor Prison, opened them up, clink, clank, clonk, and I went out, and as I went out, I thought then, and I've thought ever since, here I was being set free after about an hour inside. I wonder what the thoughts are of those prisoners who I was speaking with and we chatted afterwards over cups of tea. I wonder what their thoughts will be and are when they come out of prison into freedom of a sort. They've got to make choices, and they will make choices. They have the freedom now to make choices. 
And we were, if, I'm sure you've seen some of it on the news this last week, of prisoners being set free after only 40% of their time inside released. You saw, you saw them walking off in pairs and threes and fours and children. Sadly, already, one of the prisoners, apparently according to the news, <coughs> who was set free, he went straight back to abuse of one of the prison staff who along with others were escorting them, they didn't have to, but they decided they'd take them to, I think it was the nearest railway station or something like that. So he was arrested again back in prison. Uh, they had choices, good ones or bad ones, or maybe a bit of each as they went on in their freedom. And as we come to this passage here, it's all about the fact that we have in Jesus total freedom, total freedom to choose whether we commit sin or whether we don't. We're free. It opens up a wonderful freedom to us. You know, we don't have to sin ever again. You can quote me, I know it's true. I'm not saying we won't sin again. But we do not have to. Because if we are bound to sin a bit, there's something wrong with the gospel. It is not the power of deliverance from the power of sin. I'm not talking here about sinless perfection as something that kind of comes upon us and from then onwards we never ever sin. That is not biblical. That is not the gospel. But what is the gospel is that you don't need any longer to sin. Those besetting sins, those sins that have made us feel ashamed, made us feel sorry, made us feel sad. We don't have to be victims imprisoned to them anymore when we embrace Jesus Christ as our Saviour. Galatians 5.1, um, worth looking at, I think, um, in this respect. It is for freedom, we'll see in a moment, I think, Rob. <laughs> it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Here it is. We have been set free, but we can go back. We can choose to sin. And so Paul is saying, and the Bible is saying, and God is saying, for freedom, Christ has set you free. But don't use that freedom to go back to sin. Choose holiness. Someone said once, and I think it's true, you're as godly as you want to be. You're as holy as you want to be. Think about that before you disagree with it. <laughs> because God has provided everything for us to walk in godliness and holiness without sin. Wonderful. This passage tells us that we're free. That's why in our reading you've got these strange things. When you first read them, some people would say, hey, wait a minute, this is legalism, isn't it? This is impossible. But no, look, verse 5. Put to death. You do it. Put to death. Therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Now, if we couldn't do that, the Bible wouldn't tell us that we ought to, would it? If it wasn't a possibility, the Bible wouldn't say put to death. It might say try and put to death, but it doesn't say try and put to death. It says put to death. Therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is unnatural. <coughs> and then it goes on to say, now you must, verse 8, rid yourselves, rid yourselves. 
of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to one another. It, it might seem heavy, but it's all because we're free to do this. We're free to rid ourselves. We're free to put to death. We're free not to lie. Because we're in Christ, and he's given us the Holy Spirit, and, as, we, as we've already uh, seen, and uh, Andy has referred to it, we've received a new life, we've received a new self. Because you have to say, how can it be? How can I stop lying, or white lies? You know, how can I put to death every sin that has been part of my history, perhaps, in the past? How can I do it? Well, the answer is here. Um, it says, Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self. I like that challenging verse from the Apostle Paul in Romans 13, verse 14. Clothe yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. It's there again, isn't it? But the interesting thing is, or the complexity of it is, for people like me, you might understand it so quickly, it almost seems like a contradiction. One minute the Bible is telling us uh, that it's happened, and the next minute it's saying, you've got to do it. You've got to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to clothe yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. It's a bit of a jigsaw, isn't it? As often scriptural things are. And only the Holy Spirit can help us to live at home with them. Otherwise we intellectually struggle over it. And say that doesn't make sense. It's, isn't it contradicting itself? It isn't a contradiction, it's part of the complexity of what God does in our lives. I, I like to think of it like this. I would rever reverently say that God is a perfect gentleman in the sense that he goes to the coat hangers. And he takes down from the coat hangers a, a cloak. And it's the righteousness of Jesus. It's the holiness of Jesus. And he takes it. And he gets to us and he puts it. He stands behind us and he kind of puts it around our shoulders. And we kind of slide into it. Don't we? And we wear it. And it's a joint thing. It's God's grace to do it, to provide it. To give it, it's our responsibility to put it on. It's cooperation and, obviously, from scriptures we've already um, read, it, 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 it's something that has to be renewed or restored. <coughs> when we fail, when we don't put off, when we don't put to death, when we don't get rid of, when we keep on lying, we have to put that cloak back on again. I, I love that hymn. And can it be that I should gain a uh, an interest in the Saviour's blood? And what else? What else does that hymn say? You listen to this. You'll know it. Some of you oldies. Some of you not oldies won't know it. But listen to it. You'll learn from it. Long my imprisoned spirit lay. Fast bound in sin, and nature's not. That's a, pi a picture of the unsaved person. A prisoner <coughs> in prison. Fast bound in sin, and nature's not. And obviously, Charles Wesley was thinking, I think, of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles and the story of Peter coming out of prison released by the Lord, but he applies it to himself as to his conversion. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light, 
my chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and I followed thee. Often in our first flush, our first love, we think, I'm never going to sin again. <laughs> I'm just going to follow Jesus. If our, especially if our conversion has been very dramatic, um, very emotional. And Charles Wesley, when he was set free, when he went, went out of those prison gates into freedom, he did one thing. He followed Christ. <laughs> if he was here today, interesting to listen to him, wouldn't it? Uh, he would probably tell you that there were times when he let the Lord down, when he had to go back and confess his sin, and God, faithful and just, would forgive his sin and cleanse him from all unrighteousness. But he followed Christ when he was delivered from prison. And uh, I hope we have that same sentiment and a renewed one every day. And particularly this morning <coughs> that we are determined by the grace of God to follow Christ, to put on afresh if we need to, that clothing that we've let slip, that beautiful clothing of the Lord Jesus. We know where we get the clothing from. We had it in our reading. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its, its creator. Its creator. God has created your new life. Your new self. He created your old self too. And that's a theological problem you can sort out if you like. Um, but we became sinful. But he has created a new you, a new me, that we can put on as we look to the Creator to do that for us. We have quoted, uh, well, dare I ask you to, um, to tell me what verse we sang? 2 Corinthians 5.17 <laughs> If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. It's all consistently there, isn't it? The old life gone, the new life received, taken on, put on, God puts it on too, perfect gentleman. I'm sure the Lord will understand me saying that. So, can the leopard change his spots? Uh, no, a leopard can't change his spots. But, uh, Christian leopards can. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we can. We can. Well, we're not actually changing the spots ourselves. <coughs> We're allowing God to, to give us new clothing. We take off our old self and we put on the new self. Our spots can be changed. Our skin can be different, as it were. Our spiritual skin, our moral skin can be different. We, we sometimes sing, Your grace clothes me in righteousness. And your mercy covers me in love. Lovely chorus, that isn't it? <coughs> Isaiah 61, verse 10. Written 700 years BC. Amazing. This prophet of God was able to pen these words. Isaiah 61, verse 10. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Wow. Consistent throughout scripture. 
But this is what God does if we allow him to do it. And in fact, if we don't allow him to cover us with the righteousness of Christ, we're still outside. But here in this passage, it's the full gospel, not just forgiveness, but deliverance through the new self that God has given to us. I wonder if any of you can remember 1952, uh, Danny Kaye and the Song of the Ugly Duck. <laughs> it's a lovely song. I mean, it, it probably would be banned by the woke people nowadays because it, it's not very kind to ducks, I must admit. Um, but it, to me, it's often been a, a spiritual illustration to some extent. No, no illustration is perfect. Uh, but I'll, I'll just I'll read a bit of it too. I'm not going to sing it. I love Danny K singing it. It's, uh, how many of you remember it? Go on, put your hand. Yeah, look at him. Yes. Oh, yes. There once was an ugly duckling with feathers all stubby and brown. And the other bird said in so many words, Get out of town. Get out, get out, get out of town. And he went with a quack and a waddle and a quack in a flurry of eider down. All through the winter time. He hid himself away, ashamed to show his face, afraid of what others might say. All through the winter, in his lonely clump of weed, until a flock of swans spied him there, and very soon agreed, You're a very fine swan, indeed. A swan? Me, a swan? Ah, oh, go on. And they said, yes, you're a swan. Take a look at yourself in the lake and you'll see. And he looked and he saw and he said, I am a swan. We, <laughs> W-H, <laughs> Not a quack. I'm not such an ugly dog. No feathers all stubby and brown. For in fact, these birds in so many words said, the best in town, the best. The best, the best in town. Not a quack, not a quack, not a waddle or a quack, but a glide and a whistle and a snowy white back and a head so noble and high. Say, who's an ugly duckling? Not I. No. I, I love that song because admittedly it's not very kind to ducks who can't. It's not their fault that they're born with stubbly bits and brown and stuff, but it's, it's just the, the image, isn't it, that he, he had such a small estimation of himself. Uh, and he listened to others and he felt absolutely useless, helpless, uh, and, and he hid himself away. And then he was encouraged to look in the mirror, the pond. And when we come to God's Word, it's a mirror, isn't it? it? One of the things God's Word is meant to do is as we read it, as we subscribe to it, it shows us what we are in Christ. When we've come to Christ, then what we are in Christ. We're not ugly ducklings. We're very fine swans. Indeed. Indeed. And you can see that when you realise what you've been made in Christ, it's not a cause for pride and ostentation, but it is a reason to walk like a swan, to behave like a swan, to be a swan in reality of life and service. So, it, well, we constantly need to look at the Word and... Uh, and be encouraged and look not only for forgiveness but less and less perhaps for forgiveness but always look for deliverance from the power of sin may the Lord bless his word to us Lord we we just come to you and 
We fuddle around sometimes, Lord, with your word. We have a job to put it all together as we should, but we just thank you that we, we, we get it, Lord. We get it this morning to some extent, that we are free. We are free to choose to serve you, to choose to follow you, to choose to put away and put to death and turn from those things that grieve your Holy Spirit. And we pray for each other that we'll not only rejoice in sins forgiven, but we will rejoice that God has set us free, that you have released us from bondage to sin. So we thank you, Lord, for the fullness of your gospel and pray that we will embrace it and encourage others to realise its great potential. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're going to...